Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Kate Baldwin, Assistant Professor of Political Science. Her current research projects examine how community-level institutions interact with the national state to affect development, democracy, and conflict with a regional focus on sub-Saharan Africa. She has published articles in the American Political Science Review and the American Journal of Political Science. Today we talk with her about her book project about the paradox of hereditary chiefs in democratic Africa. Welcome, Professor Baldwin. Thank you so much for having me. So let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Okay, well, uh, in Africa, one of the most important recent developments um, has been the spread of democracy in the past two decades. So at the national level, at least, most governments are uh, now democratic in the sense, at least, that they are elected, they compete in competitive elections. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at the local level, many uh, communities are still governed by unelected traditional leaders. And what's more, if we look across Africa, these leaders actually seem to have more influence in the countries that are more democratic at the national level. Uh, and so this is sort of both puzzling and a bit concerning because how democratic can these countries really be if they're still at the local level, people are, the citizens are interacting with unelected leaders. Um, and so the motivation for the project was really trying to understand what is the impact of these traditional chiefs on democratic accountability? And maybe more centrally, um, do these traditional chiefs undermine democratic representation? And uh, the answer I provide is actually a, a little bit counterintuitive mm -hmm. um, in that it turns out that these local chiefs who are unelected and have significant coercive power, they actually facilitate democratic representation in rural areas insofar as the uh, central bureaucracy in Africa is so weak that elected representatives aren't able to implement programming and policies that voters want without their assistance. Uh -huh. Okay, very interesting. So what led you to write the book? So uh, when I first um, set off to do this research project, I, I arrived in Zambia, and I really wasn't intending to research traditional chiefs at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I'm a political scientist, and I was really interested in the institutions by which rural citizens got access to state resources. Mm -hmm. And you know, because of my training, I was sort of looking for uh, maybe the role of political parties or the formal state bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. But when I got on the ground in Zambia, uh, I found out that in rural areas, these institutions didn't really exist the way I expected them to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so political parties were largely absent um, in, in rural areas. They were not very active. Um, there was also very little presence of the central government agencies in, in remote areas. Instead, on a day-to-day -day level, the people who were governing these communities were traditional chiefs. So if a rural Zambian has a problem, the uh, person who they're most likely to take it to is their village headman or maybe the traditional chief who is above him. If they have a dispute with a neighbor, they're most likely to take it to the chief's court. Mm -hmm. um, so this was both uh, you know, uh, surprising in, in, for a political scientist. Um, there's been very little written in political science um, about the role of traditional chiefs. And even social scientists more generally haven't done very much research on how traditional chiefs affect like, the national political process. Mm -hmm. But it was also just seemed like a really important question because as I mentioned earlier, you know, how democratic can countries be if at the local level citizens are still mainly interacting with unelected leaders? Right, right. Okay, so why don't you tell us what exactly a traditional chief is and what their role um, in the community is? Okay, so first of all, um, I want to emphasize when I use the term traditional chief, I don't mean to imply that, that their position is sort of timeless and unchanging. Okay. Um, so I think of traditional chiefs as chiefs who have power by virtue of their association with the customs of their community. Mm -hmm. So um, they're popularly thought of as being related to tradition, but this doesn't mean their position hasn't changed over time. Okay. In fact, during the colonial period, um, the, you know, the positions of these leaders did change greatly. The, tr the colonial state uh, recognized some leaders, pre-existing leaders, and they didn't recognize mm -hmm. others. They uh, generally changed their powers during this time period. Um, and in fact, traditional chiefs got quite a, a bad reputation in the late colonial period so that the independence era leaders uh, 
for the most part, were um, had very negative attitudes towards them. Mm -hmm. At worst, they viewed them as traitors who'd been complicit in the colonial project, um, and at best, they just sort of viewed them as these sort of anachronistic leaders who they thought would sort of fade away into the sunset with time. Um, but uh, fast forward, you know, to uh, the last 20 years, and actually, we see that traditional chiefs still exist um, across much of Africa. And at the local level, they still are very important actors. So mm -hmm. they um, run, run uh, court systems. They often play an important role in allocating land. And they play um, a really important role in um, organizing community contributions to local projects. So we might think of this kind of as uh, organizing informal taxes. So if a community needs to come together and build a school or to um, maintain a road, it's typically the chief who will fundraise or organize the community to um, provide free labor for the mm -hmm. project. Um, and so the chiefs, you know, they exist uh, across much of sub-Saharan Africa. And what's more, they seem to be more important at the local level in the more democratic countries. And this is a little bit you know, why, why would this be? But to take a step back and think about it, um, in the post-independence period, there were very few elected governments in Africa. Mm -hmm. And what that actually meant was that for the most part, politicians could ignore the, um, the plight of rural citizens. The rural majority could be ignored because these, these politicians weren't facing elections. The introduction of competitive elections means all of a sudden, these leaders need to figure out a way to win votes sure. from rural, uh, rural voters. And what do rural voters want? For the most part, it's, it's very basic things. You know, they want s schools and clinics and roads and, and wells. There is, the state is so weak in so much of rural Africa that these elected politicians don't have a mechanism for responding to, um, to these demands. Um, on their own. Uh, there aren't state bureaucracies they can rely on mm -hmm. to, um, to, to uh, organize these projects. Elected leaders could try to go to these communities and, and, and initiate things by themselves, but um, it turns out that's also difficult for them. Uh, they have obligations perhaps in the capital city that they need to attend to. Um, and they, you know, elected leaders are generally in office for only a short period of time. So they don't necessarily have the local level institutions um, that they can use to organize communities to provide projects. Uh, and so this is where traditional leaders come in. And they actually play a really important role in facilitating the work of elected leaders, especially in so far as a lot of um, resources um, and, and projects, the way that they're provided in, in rural Africa is through what co-produced, co-production. So the central state um, provides some resources and the communities are also expected to provide some resources for the projects. Mm -hmm. And so um, the organization of the community labor or the community fundraising, in general, elected politicians aren't that effective at doing that on their own. This is where they turn to traditional chiefs and traditional chiefs right. can help okay. them out. Okay, um, are traditional chiefs um, given any kind of compensation for their role in the community? Um, so uh, that uh, really varies widely from country uh, across to country. country. I think it's important to note that the reason why these traditional chiefs can do this is um, I don't want to take a romanticized view of them as, as, as these actors who are, you know, totally selfless and just care about their community. Where I think different from uh, elected politicians is not so much in their motivations. We can think of both of them as being quite self-interested. Mm -hmm. But traditional chiefs, you know, are, um, inherit their positions, they live in their communities for lives, um, and they, uh, they're, so their economic well-being is very much tied up with that of their local community. Mm -hmm. So as a result, they have an incentive to organize communities to come together and provide um, their contributions to projects mm -hmm. um, because they're going to benefit in the long run if their community's welfare sure. improves. Mm -hmm. um, where they differ from you know, elected politicians, again, is, is in the length of their time horizon. So an elected politician might want to be able to provide a school right now, but they might not, not expect to be in power you know, 10 years down the road. Sure. And so they don't have the same incentive to organize, sort of create institutions that allow the community to work together collectively. Mm -hmm. Traditional chiefs, by virtue of their longer time horizons, do have an incentive to do this. So by virtue of, you know, on an individual level and also um, the longer length of time these traditional institutions have just existed over time, these um, institutions can facilitate the um, elected politicians work at the right. local level. D typically are um, hereditary chiefs in position, in that position until they 
die? I mean, how long do it's they stay in the role? So, um, again, there is slight variation, but in general, most chiefs are um, selected for life. Okay. And it is, you know, they would have to do something very egregious um, in order to be uh, removed prior okay. to death. Okay. How did you do the research? So what countries did you look at? So, um, at, you know, traditional chiefs are sort of an uh, unusual topic for um, political scientists. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the challenges I had, you know, in, in trying to develop this research design was uh, developing a design that both allowed me sort of to understand the complexity of their roles while also being able to generalize across cases. Mm -hmm. So the way I did this is sort of a, through a, a multi-tiered approach. So at the narrowest and deepest level, um, uh, my book project builds on research that was done at two sites in Zambia, okay. um, one in the northern province and one in the eastern um, province. And um, uh, in Z Zambia is a Central African country. It's very poor. Um, it's landlocked. Uh, it has um, a, a, actually a strong history of competitive elections. So um, since 1991, uh, there have been numerous presidential and parliamentary elections, and actually there's been government turnover. So we have competitive elections at the national level, but in rural Zambia, there's still you know, almost 300 chiefs who have uh, quite a bit of influence at, at the local level. And, um, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Is there one chief per town, for instance? Uh, so chiefs, um, on average, you can think of them as controlling territories that are much bigger than towns, okay. um, it, but uh, the populations would only be about 10,000, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so they're, they're geographically designated in Zambia. And um, so there are these two research sites, um, and again, so it was in the eastern and uh, the northern region of, of the province, uh, of the country. Um, I conducted extensive research, so I, you know, did um, household surveys, I did interviews with the chief, I spent a lot of time in those communities, so I had my own observations, and then, um, but from there I wanted to be able to, you know, reach out and, and, and generalize beyond that. So mm -hmm. um, in three provinces of, of Zambia, I uh, conducted um, uh, comprehensive um, interviews with all of the traditional chiefs in those three provinces. There are um, uh, seven rural provinces in, 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 in Zambia, so that was about half of them. And I uh, interviewed um, uh, a large proportion of the elected politicians from those provinces too. Mm -hmm. Then I wanted to generalize a little beyond that too, so I relied on uh, data from the, the ministries um, in, in, in the capital of Zambia, Lusaka, and the archives to create a data set that actually covers all of the chiefs okay. um, in, in Zambia uh, from the period uh, at which uh, uh, competitive elections were reintroduced in 1991 to the present. Um, and then finally, I, I wanted to be able to say something beyond Zambia too, and so I also test some of the implications of the theory I um, developed uh, cross-nationally using um, mm -hmm. data that was collected by other people for the most part in other countries. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, the broader implications. So um, I think uh, at the, you know, so the research shows that um, in many ways, the role of chiefs is more positive than many people have um, suggested. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think there's sort of two important findings that come out of, of the research for the book. So first, uh, I think one of the most important findings is actually sort of a negative finding. Many people have thought that traditional chiefs can deliver um, voters on block to whichever political party they choose, which would be really um, damaging for democratic accountability. It would sort of suggest that voters can be, you know, um, forced to vote for whoever the chief prefers mm -hmm. without any consideration of their own interest. Um, and actually, the research suggests that that's not the case. Really? You know, for the most part, um, uh, people in, uh, understand that their vote is secret. They may feel obliged to obey the chief's instructions in certain realms, but they don't necessarily think they have to obey them in the political realm. So on one hand, that's sort of a, a very positive thing for democratic mm -hmm. accountability. Uh, second, as I already alluded to, these chiefs play a really important role in uh, facilitating democratic accountability insofar as they sort of help the elected politicians implement programming at the very local level mm -hmm. in communities. So this is sort of like the central paradox of the book. These unelected leaders facilitate the work of uh, um, elected leaders. Uh, then, um, but no, there are so also, there. There are some cons as well of uh, working with, say, with tra traditional chiefs, that are not so and um, great. so obviously uh, the 
situation where um, elected politicians need to rely on these uh, unelected traditional chiefs to implement um, local programming is not ideal compared to a situation where they could instead rely on a neutral, meritocratic bureaucracy. Um, but in the short term, that's not an option. So um, I don't think that that, that, you know, that criticism, I, I think we can push aside uh, at least in the short term. Mm -hmm. A more serious criticism is because traditional chiefs sort of provide this stopgap or almost band-aid solution, allowing politicians to deliver resources to rural communities without a strong bureaucracy, they prevent, um, they reduce the incentive to invest in strengthening the bureaucracy. And in the long run, okay. that might actually be a much more effective way. It probably would be a more effective way of delivering these resources mm -hmm. and providing programming to people in rural Africa. So, um, so you know, there's sort of this short-term, long-term trade-off right. here. Okay. Well, very fascinating stuff, I have to say. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing some of your work. Thank you very much for having me. For more information about Professor Baldwin and her work, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.